Uh, once again, I'm Bob Meyer. Um, I'm a faculty, one of the faculty co-directors here at AI Wharton. I'm also a professor in the marketing department. And, uh, and today we're going to be doing a webinar, and this is one of a series that we're going to be having uh, on, um, on the way in which AI is sort of affecting everyone's lives and how it's affecting individuals and business. And today we're going to be talking about some, we have three great panelists who are going to be talking about the issue of AI and machine creativity. Um, and I think for most people, when you think about uh, what are the, some of the excitement, so exciting and also worrisome aspects of AI, uh, it's this idea that they can act, we could actually get to the point where machines match humans in terms of their ability to uh, not only create ideas, but also create images and so on and so on and so on. Um, and so as a way of exploring this, we have three panelists today. Um, Yannick Exner, who is a doctoral researcher, as you see, at the Tum School of Management at Munich. Um, D.K. Lee, who is associate professor at BU. Um, and also uh, um, uh, Anke Sisodia, uh, who is an assistant professor at Purdue University. Uh, now, before we get started, um, um, uh, hold on. Um, 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 I'll give you kind of an overview of the uh, the layout here. Uh, what we're going to be doing is I'm going to they're going to have each of the speakers is going to speak for maybe about seven minutes, maybe a little bit more if they want to, to give an overview of their research and their views on this particular topic. Um, then I'm going to interact with them a little bit on uh, on questions, but basically I think we want to keep this thing free flowing and very interactive, so that uh, if anybody else wants to have something critical they want to jump in, please feel free to do so. And then really, I think it's going to be the most fun part of it is towards the end where we're going to have an open 15 minute or maybe more uh, section for Q and A audience participation. Um, now, a little bit about, um, before we get started, a little bit about what AI at Wharton is. Um, this is a relatively new initiative undertaken by the Wharton School, uh, in which we're trying to basically develop the Wharton School as being a focal point for research that's related to AI, as it affects businesses, as it affects people. Um, and effectively, we want to develop the idea that uh, if you're interested in work and related to how AI is affecting future at work, uh, business solutions, education, uh, people, consumers, and so forth, that uh, AI at Wharton will represent um, a, a melting part for that, not only as a source for providing funding for work in this area, but also providing a, a source of, di of, um, of um dissemination of knowledge in that area. Hence, this, this webinar series is one part of that. A little bit about some of the people that are involved. Uh, I'm one of four co-directors, and on the line over there is uh, Mary Perk. Uh, she's the executive director, and she's the one that kind of makes uh, all of this happen. Uh, and along with me is Stefano Pantoni, who's my colleague in the marketing department, um, uh, Kardik Hosanger, uh, Hosanger, who is the, in the OID department here, uh, and also Sunny Tambe, who is also in the, uh, the OID department. Now, before we get going, one, one last final thing is I want to give you a plug for a couple of things that we have coming up. Uh, one of which is if you like these Ebb webinar series, um, we have a couple more that are coming up, one of which is AI in the Workforce, um, uh, and that's coming up on February 16th. And another one is going to be on AI and innovation. Same basic format. Uh, it's going to be for about an hour long. And hopefully we have these things, not only some great speakers on these webinars, but also really an opportunity to have a broad discussion over these topics. Um, the other thing is we have uh, coming up on May 22nd or 23rd in Philadelphia, we're going to have an actual physical conference. So if you're kind of tired of the webinar Zoom thing and you actually want to see people and see um, people physically, come to the uh, um, to the AI at Future at Work conference um, and you see kind of the link to it down there and I encourage you to go ahead and make an application for it. Um, okay, so to get going, um, uh, today our panelists are going to be, as I said, uh, Yannick Exner, D.K. Lee, and uh, Anke Sisodia. Uh, we're going to start off with uh, Yannick, and uh, he's going to be talking about some of his work on the power of generative marketing. Can generative AI reach human-level visual marketing content? Uh, um, Yannick? Great. Thanks, Robert. And let me just share my screen. 
Maybe first of all, thanks for the invitation and uh, also organizing this. Uh, I think Mary, Carol, and Katie, uh, it's great to be here. And I think you should see my screen now. Perfect. Uh, so I would like, love to talk about uh, the power of generative marketing, which is joint work with my co-authors, Jochen Hartmann and Samuel Domde. And uh, we wondered whether generative AI imagery can reach human levels in terms of marketing content and whether this marketing content is uh, similarly good than uh, typical human level traditional content. And as we started off, I think we all had a very similar experience in 2023, which was the year of generative AI, uh, that we've seen all of this anecdotal evidence that generative AI is being adopted in, in, a, in a broad area of uh, use cases. So we've seen like big uh, newspaper outlets using generative AI to, to cover the cover page with uh, generated content and print advertisement. We've seen advertisements and also in ideation areas of product design, uh, generative AI at work with quite impressive results. And uh, last but not least, uh, I think all of us have seen it in social media. And this my feed was just filled all the way to the top with uh, Gen AI and nuggets. So, but from a researcher or a scientific perspective, we asked ourselves whether this actually works in terms of marketing metrics. So how do people perceive these images and how do they react up, of the, up on them, uh, especially if they are not prime? So if they do not know whether this uh, image is AI generated or not. To do so, we needed to find a way to compare human images with generated images and uh, came up with this approach, which we will use throughout this talk today. So I'd just like to quickly elaborate on it. Where we start with a human image on the left-hand side, so this is our benchmark image, just a typical human image. In this case, it's a social media image. And we would like to uh, derive a lower, but basically come to the right-hand side where we have a what we call synthetic sibling. An AI-generated image, which looks more or less the same, has the same visual features in it and uh, the same objects. So, but to do this, and especially at scale, we uh, developed a, this process where we ran this human image on the left-hand side through an image-to-text model called, in this our case, Clip Interrogator, which gave us, a, in a sense, a compressed image, a textual description of this image. Uh, in this case, a woman sitting on top of a mountain with a backpack. Um, so this way, we, we capture or we grasp the most important aspect of the image, uh, even though we cannot capture everything. For example, the details in the valley in the background. Uh, and then we ran it through a text-to-image model, just the reverse of what we've just done a second ago, and we generate this synthetic image, AI generated. Now, to scale this and not do this with a single image, uh, we've done this with six images on the left-hand side. These were the benchmark images, and with 13 different diffusion models to generate 20 image images per diffusion model. So a total of 6 times 13 times 20, roughly a little bit more than 1,500 images. And now that we generated the images, our main question was, as we discussed before, right, does it work? And we assess those dependent variables, like quality and realism in terms of perception. Uh, so we set up a, a, like a survey with, with humans who were not prime, so they did not know whether this image that they've seen was human-made or AI-generated, and had them rate this on a typical Likert scale from one very low quality to Five point Likert scale, six very high uh, quality, and the same for realism. And what we learned is, well, it does work with a little asterisk. So it works. We're kind of getting to a point where we are statistically indistinguishable in terms of the perception of quality and realism. So people uh, have a similar perception of AI generated content with human generated content. Now, looking specifically into uh, what this, what this looks like in terms of model-free evidence. Uh, we see here just the average uh, score of those images on those two quality uh, and realism dimension, quality on the x-axis and realism on the y-axis. Um, now, if we, for example, look at the top left, the benchmark is the little triangle, uh, we see that AI is very often better than uh, the benchmark image, the human one, which could also relate to the quality of the human one. Uh, but we also see at the bottom left, right, for example, the, uh, the, the Schwarzkopf advertisement where the human benchmark just far outperforms all of the AI models, which could be due to a variety of reasons. For example, text where the machine creativity is not as good as 
the human creativity or the human quality. Um, so when running this on a more sophisticated manner with regression models, we learned that very often there's no statistical distinguishability or significance between AI and human. So we can say that AI and humans are kind of on par, at least we cannot differentiate with them between them. And similarly, we even have some images like at the top left where the AI images outperform the human counterpart. Now, in a second question, we asked ourselves, does it work in marketing? And uh, specifically here, very similar setup, we looked at the likelihood to like an image or the likelihood to comment on this image and uh, ran this with social media use cases. Again, in the lab, we asked people, how likely are you to like upon it, uh, to like this image or to comment upon this and uh, learned the same thing. It works. We get to statistical indistinguishability, uh, but not in all the cases. Let me just skip this today because we're a little time constrained. So we immediately jump to number three, which was the verification in the real world, uh, where we ran an actual marketing campaign and assess the click-through rate as our dependent variable. So we have ran a campaign with all of those images, just kind of in an A-B setting, uh, and assessed how high the click-through rate is for those images. And again, we reach a level where we cannot distinguish between AI and human content. So if we look at the results here, uh, we see that this is the table on the right-hand side. All the way, you see the click-through rate, our dependent variable. And we see that the benchmark, the human image, ranks 10 out of uh, 14, where versus the best model, stable diffusion 1.3, we do not have a sig significant difference, but still it's a positive significant uh, difference of 21.5%. So nine of our 13 AI models yield a higher click-through rate than the human benchmark. And we also learn, because now this is significant, uh, that the best performing model in the last two or the worst two performing models actually have a significant uh, outperformance or underperformance versus the best model. Uh, and hence, we, we argue that model choice matters and is also what we will probably find from a very subjective view uh, looking into this. And yeah, if you're interested, then here's the link to, to the paper and thank you for being here. Thanks a lot. Um, before we jump on to the next speaker, um... Uh, uh, Yannick, sort of, what what do you kind of see the uh, some of the the applications of this uh, going forward? Mm -hmm. um, I think we are probably looking because the cost of generating images uh, are so so much lower um, that we are very likely to look into a future of uh, either much more tailored content. So you could go to like a like a hyper targeting of n equals one, and you would not have uh, specific groups of uh, of customer or target groups but rather you can target a single person with a specific image um, or, or it just goes the other way that we get like more and more trash in a sense because it's so cheap to generate uh, and it's hard to call it quality control for it. So we don't really know what's out there, but people just shoot in the hope for it working to some extent. Okay, okay. Yes. I just, I, I guess I, I have to ask you, maybe someone else um, has a, a comment, a question on this as well, is that obviously this is not, you know, this whole, the, the ability to develop, you know, hyper-realistic images where we can't tell the difference between whether a person took it or a machine took it or whether it's of a, of a person, you know, or, you know, or purely synthetic, you know, it's obviously fairly controversial of late. And I was kind of wondering, what's your take on that? Like, like to what degree... Uh, uh, you know, should there be, uh, we should we be, be starting thinking about regulations in terms of imposing the work that you do? Not to put you on the spot. Yeah, so I think it's, it's a very broad discussion, especially if you take open source models and kind of community maintained or community fine-tuned models into account. So where people just kind of on their own computer fine-tune models and uh, kind of go beyond what you would say is allowed per regulation. Uh, so this kind of limits to what we can do with regulation. On the other hand, we can, um, I mean, for big players, let's say, for example, for Google Ads or uh, like just the typical marketing channels, there's for sure ways to uh, to assess this, but I'm not sure whether this would be like an industry role uh, or like a regulatory role. And this is like to partly partially also what we see. So if if you maybe to just add this point, um, those community based models, they allow you to have many more degrees of freedom. So you can generate much more content and diverse content with them. Um, but on the same time, they're not as accessible. 
Okay. Okay. That's, that's interesting. Um, well, hopefully we can, yeah, go ahead. Um, we can uh, go ahead and circulate back to that um, uh, and talk a little bit later. So uh, next on deck is DK Lee from uh, BU. So uh, DK, BK. All right. Uh, let me share my, I think the screen is shared. All right, uh, thanks for having me. Great to be here. Thank you for organizing. I'd like to present this uh, Generative AI, Human Creativity and Art. This is joint work with my student, Eric Zhou. And you can find a paper here at tiny.cc slash genart. So just a little bit of background. So since I have only seven minutes, this will be more of an overview. I'll be very quick about it. Uh, I think all the audience here know that in 2022, that uh, text to image model, uh, was used to win a state art fair. And shortly after that, even photography uh, art contest was won with these tools and the artists refused to get the uh, prize after that. Uh, shortly after, you know, not too long ago, there was a psychological science study that was published saying that people perceive AI generated faces as more real than uh, actual human faces. Um, so I'm gonna just skip through this uh, brief history. Um, there has been a lot of um, work since about 2015, 16, uh, but it, it's not until 2022, March, when Midjourney, Dali 2, and Stable Diffusion all came out within a couple of months that it became mainstream. And you can see estimated number of users on top. And now we have Dali 3 built in. Bar just announced this a couple of days ago. So we, you know, it's becoming more mainstream than ever. So research question we asked here is uh, how does adoption of generative AI in particular text to image model where you prompt it and then you get a automated image out affect humans creative productivity? Uh, first easy question. And second is, is generative AI enabling humans to produce more creative content? And here we piggyback on the philosophy of creativity literature where it defines creativity in two different parts, a value, which is contextual and novelty, which I'll talk about how we operationalize this. And lastly, we also explore for whom and when is Gen AI effective? So the empirical setting was one of the largest art sharing platform. Um, this, uh, where people share and like and favorite and comments. Um, and outcome variable of interest for us was for uh, each individual artist uh, productivity as measured by log of monthly number of posts. Value, uh, it's defined in the, the social media itself, favorites per view. Um, you, can, you, you can just use favorites or views. Uh, we decided to control for views. Novelty is we operationalize it using, uh, you know, other large language, multimodal language model to embed and find the vector representation. Uh, it's defined as pairwise distance for each artifact, in this case, artwork, compared to all prior artifact, all the produced artwork. And we have identified adopters, text to image model users, which in our um, analysis enters as treated versus the non-adopters then controls. And we see the impact of uh, artists adopting these tools on productivity and creativity. So how do people express their creativity and novelty? Um, so humans can express, this is one, uh, one way we operationalize and that's humans can express creativity via two main ways, um, content and visuals. Content is literally what is in the picture or uh, art, right? Concerns the focal object and relations depicted in the artifacts and visual considers the stylistic and pixel level uh, elements. So here two by two, table shows you have same content, both cats and some sort, same visuals. It looks like you know, it's easily maybe same sort of animation. Uh, here you have both cats, therefore same content, but different visuals. So this one has a bit more a flatter uh, uh, visual. And here similar visual, uh, but different content. Here you have different content and visuals. So we can operationalize this with using multimodal language models and Based on our data set, here is most novel content. So, so for example, fractal landscape or chance magnetic excitation field comes out as the most novel content. This is least novel content. So, uh, you know, some mountain or portraiture, something that you may see um, a lot of. And here is the most novel visual. So, 
pixel level or style element, this is what our algorithm said was the most novel compared to least novel visual. Uh, so again, this is something that you may see uh, in museums or something. Uh, this was the most valuable versus least valuable. So the Y variable of interest, um, mice and cocoa, um, about 61% of uh, people who viewed it favored it, uh, as opposed to these two. Someone actually uploaded a Shutterstock image <laughs> in the website. Nobody liked it. Uh, and the other one, I don't know why it didn't get so much love. All right, so right on to the uh, actual you know, result. Uh, we see, uh, obviously, significant lift in cre creative productivity within the first several months. So it increases by 50% during the first month of adoption. Um, so x-axis, you see months since adoption and the y variable here uh, in the y-axis. And with the 100%, so doubling the amount of number of art produced following uh, in the following month, uh, stabling off to about 25% uh, in months after. Um, so we have m many more months after this and still uh, consistently at around 25%. So this translates to about, at, for an average adopter, about seven additional posts during the adoption month, up to 15 additional posts in the following month. So average people post um, 15. Okay. Now, what happens to value, right? Value here is defined as number of favorites earned per view, uh, percentage of favorites earned per view. Um, on average, people on the platform or artwork gather about two favorite uh, two favorites per hundred views. So 2% rate. Now you can see again here, once the uh, treated or the people who adopt uh, text to image model, they, their value also goes up. Over a 1% increase in the likelihood of re receiving favorites per view, right? Uh, this, this translates to about 50% increase over pre-treatment value, right? What happens to novelty? Um, so average content novelty, actually what's in depicted within the uh, image, uh, you can see it, it goes down on average. So people are producing similar kind of content uh, once they adapt. However, the peak max novelty continue to increase which means that while there is a, some sort of inefficiency, people producing same sort of content, uh, the creative landscape is actually growing, uh, you know, as a result of these artists adopting text to image models, right? Um, so the result for visual novelty, actually is, you can see stark decrease. And this is somewhat obvious because people are using these models, mid journey in stable diffusion and Dolly three or Dolly two back then. And these are trained to sort of produce similar things, uh, unless you have a wildly different uh, and your prompt foo is really great, it's, it's hard to get uh, very different things, right? So you can see this increase uh, decreasing. But who is really winning and when? Um, generative AI decreases content and visual novelty in aggregate, except it is increasing the content creativity landscape. Uh, who wins and for what? And what type of novelty bring value? I'm skipping this due to time. Please read the paper mm -hmm. uh, it's an advertisement. Um, but I want to uh, you know, present two more, uh, easy to understand. So we also uh, tracked the, uh, the, the correlation to value, again, favorites earned per view, um, between that and visual novelty and content novelty over time. And you can see as time goes, Content novelty actually is highly correlated or predictive of the value capture. So in the land of mid journey, content is king, right? And lastly, who captures value? So we wanted to see the value here, again, defined as the favorites are in per view. Um, once people adopt this, does it actually spread or concentrate the value captured? Um, and long story short, uh, generate this this tool is promoting more equal value capture. So adopters among the adopters, favorites per view is spread more evenly. So takeaways, mm -hmm. productivity increases, value increases. Um, there is a content novelty, average content novelty decreases, but the peak novelty content novelty increases, suggesting inefficient, but still expanding uh, creative landscape. Visual novelty is decreasing overall. 
winners and losers divided. I didn't really talk about that. Um, and Gen AI promotes more equal value capture among the adopters. So I would like to say, we would like to say, this is sort of a human AI generative synesthesia happening. Uh, Gen AI dreams up as the world would, right? Having all these knowledge and individuals filter. Right? And that's it. Great, thank you. Uh, there have been a, a couple of questions that kind of popped in. We might as well sort of get them and get them. Uh, one of which was that, you know, are there any uh, confounding factors like the style of painting, say watercolor, vector art, oil, pastel, et cetera, which influences um, uh, some of those numbers, that some of those things that you presented? Uh, so the question is, I, I don't understand the uh, confounding. Uh, mm -hmm. but well, okay, now it, it, it's a fact, not really confounding, but basically, or, or um, uh, in terms of when people are responding to novelty, for example, what is the novelty? You know, is it uh, uh, suddenly what oh. what stands out is, oh my gosh, you never see brush strokes like that, or is it something about the uh, uh, the image itself? I see. Yeah, the question. Yeah. So it's not. So the users don't give uh, value of novelty. That's our algorithm based okay. on large language model that's learned, uh, has seen way more uh, arts and paintings than any individual would I ever see, would. And okay. then we, yeah, similar. Mm -hmm. So it just yeah. embeds that. And then we uh, see the distance. So uh, yeah. Okay. okay, so so I guess within that then, what goes into that? Like for example, uh, can you become more novel if you just simply make it oil, okay? Uh, as opposed to everything else. So that would contribute to it, right? That would be uh, all yeah. incorporated. For example, mm -hmm. if a digital image can distinguish all of these different features, the, mm -hmm. the multi large language multimodal, um, yeah. multimodal large language models would be able to tell apart uh, the differences if the digital images actually do uh, have that representation. Okay. Uh, there's one other question which kind of related to one I want to ask, and maybe we could hold this off to later, but it's the question of um, to what degree uh, uh, that having access to these tools make you be more productive or creative in other domains. Um, uh, like certainly it's the case that doing this allows people to do paintings and things they never could have possibly have imagined. Uh, they can just dream things and suddenly it comes to be. Uh, and, and, um, and also in some sense, um, uh, so, so for example, does it help you be more open to problem solving in other contexts? Or a question came up is um, um, uh, it, um, in, in the context of like teamwork and so forth. Um, do you, do you, this is a little, obviously you don't study that, but uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I, not in this study, but we do right. have some ideas related to that, like how generative AI tools could be used to promote uh, group productivity. Um, so I think one way it could do is you can automate a lot of divergent thinking, right? Uh, and then you can ask the tools to provide divergent thinking. Um, okay. and, yeah. and, uh, and in the end, it's always, it's great as a sort of brainstorming tool and right. people always like, you know, filter things. Uh, so in a way, I, I think it'll mm. follow the same sort of, uh, uh, MO, right. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, one other question before we move on to, uh, uh to, uh, Anik, um, uh, in that, did you have a sense for like the number of, uh, this is a, another question that came up, uh, the number of interactions to generate the final image, like, uh, uh, oh. like, yeah, like, like do people, it's just all of a sudden they get a, a brilliant idea or is it the fact that it takes them a really long time to get these, these really more creative images? Very good question. And we actually have a working, uh, not working, but we, we just started a paper on that where we actually collect all the user level in uh, prompting and activities on the journey. And it, you can see it, literally everything, their prompt, their images, yeah. what do they do? Do they accept their word, like, you know, upscale or take it? So we'll have some answers in within a couple of months, I would say. Okay, but you don't have any answers now though. Uh, no, I mean, okay. Uh, I did <laughs> right. okay, we'll have to stay I, tuned. Okay. Yeah, one thing, yeah, lot, like one thing I tried this uh, contest within my class and it, the variance is very high. People just like prompt like 20 times or just there are people who are happy after twice, you know. So. Yeah, yeah, good. Okay, well, thank you very, very much. Um, so next up is um, Anik Sisodia uh, from Purdue. And he's gonna be talking about some very interesting work on using um, uh, some AI tools for product design. So Anik. Uh, 
Uh, hi, everybody. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And uh, so I'll be talking about how can we use, you know, deep learning methods to find interesting product attributes and then use them to, you know, generate new products. So this is joint work with uh, Alex Burnap and Vineet Kumar, uh, both at Yale. Uh, all right. Right. So, I mean, the motivation for this project was uh, before even all generative AI tools became, you know, uh, widespread, was that we knew that, you know, visual design matters for consumer choices across product categories, that when you go to buy a car or buy fashion or buy furniture, you don't just, you know, go and see what are the performance characteristics of cars or of, you know, apparel or a furniture, but you also look at how do they, you know, look and a lot of your choice get, gets influenced by the product's looks. So next, what we thought was that, okay, we want to incorporate some information from these products, visual appearance into our subsequent uh, econometric models. So how do we do that? So our goal became that, suppose we have lots and lots of images of products. We want to find a method that discovers these product attributes or visual characteristics. And this method then automatically quantifies all these characteristics. And if it is able to do so, then we can use them in some well-known marketing applications like perceptual mapping, visual conjoint analysis, which I'll talk about, and recommendation system. So this is an important point. So what we want is for each product, we want to find a vector of visual characteristics, let's say a G-dimensional vector. And we want that vector to be uh, having interpretable characteristics. So I'll just explain in a couple of slides, what do I mean by interpretability over here? So, right. So, so we base our methodology on disentanglement representation learning. Uh, this is one of the subfields within representation learning and deep learning. And the way to, uh, you know, it can be defined is that uh, in a very layman's language is, suppose if I change the value of one particular dimension, let's say Z1, and I fix all the other dimensions, then the image should only change in one particular way. So if you look at the top row over here, I'm changing Z1, keeping all the other J dimensions fixed, and only dial color is changing. Similarly, in second row, I'm just changing Z2, keeping others fixed, and I see that strap color is changing. So in a way, if we look from our you know, human eyes, we are able to clearly say that, okay, this is very, very interpretable. And what this helps is that, you know, if such a tool is available to product designers, et cetera, it can allow for controllable image generation. So they will be able to very minutely vary, you know, each of these dimensions and then see the subsequent change. So uh, we base our methodology on a well-known uh, uh, algorithm and deep learning BAE. I won't go into the details, but uh, you can go and refer to the, uh, the paper. Uh, what this entanglement does is it imposes one additional constraint on top of VAE. And these are technical details I won't go uh, into today, but uh, it is essentially not very sophisticated like the, like the modern generative AI tools, but it still allows us to see interpretable visual characteristics. Now, uh, this particular uh, uh, framework uh, runs into a theoretical problem uh, which says that if you just use images, that is, you just do unsupervised learning, uh, then you know there are some uh, conditions in which it says that it cannot; it's fundamentally impossible. So essentially, you require some sort of supervision. You require some labels. So one common approach is that you get people to label, you know, products. You ask people to tell, okay, how dark is the dial color? How big is the you know dial size, etc. But the problem with this approach for us was that we did not want to use any you know, human involved. We wanted the method to find it on its own. So one of our methodological contributions in this work was that to use some information that is already present 
to us as marketing researchers. So we thought that, you know, if designers of different brands are already designing products, you know, differently, differentiating their uh, brand visually from other brands, then perhaps brand can serve as a good, you know, label. Uh, in other contexts, we thought that perhaps at different price points, maybe products are designed differently, then price might serve as a good label. So we tried both of these, you know, supervisory signals, and then we went on to estimate our model in which we added one supervised loss, which is right here over at the end. So this is the way to estimate the model. Again, I won't go into the details, but uh, uh, probably I'll skip a couple of slides over here and go to something more interesting. Right, so we use data set from Christie's in which you know we had images like these of all the wristwatches that had been auctioned there from 2001 to 2020. We collected a bunch of other you know, information about these watches. Then we ran our method and we found six visual characteristics. We varied Z1, we're finding its dial color, dial size, strap color, rim color or the bezel color, knob size, and dial shape. So these are the six characteristics which our method was saying, you know, varies a lot in wristwatches. There are other finer details which this method is not able to, you know, find. These are the six coarse characteristics that this method is able to find. Now we use this to conduct visual conjoint analysis. Essentially in visual conjoint analysis, the first challenge is you want to know the characteristics which this method gives. And the second thing is you have to specify the particular quantification of each characteristic and generate you know, different designs. So this method is able to do that. And we kept some uh, of you know, respondent choices in the training set, some in the test set. Then we measured the, uh, the, the accuracy of our embedding over other pre-trained nets. And we found that you know, ours was having a very good accuracy. And interestingly, to uh, you know, for all people interested in application of this particular work, is we could generate you know the ideal watches for different consumer segments. So when we ran our survey, we asked people about their demographic details, and we could find that okay, the watch on the left is the ideal watch for a young, moderately affluent female, whereas watch on the right is probably which is preferred most by older males. So this uh, you know, work can uh, probably you know, guide product designers into how they can design products which will be liked by people. Uh, yeah, we found you know, that these ideal watches do take up a lot of choice share from these segments, but do not take choice share in the rival segment. Sorry, so, so just to conclude, so I think I, uh, you know, probably assured you that you know how you, we can use deep learning methods to find interpretable characteristics. Uh, these would be very uh, useful in case of you know regulation that comes up that says that you know people should be recommended things which they should be able to control their recommendations, etc. Uh, some of the rules that have been proposed in Europe you know allude to that. And for managerial application, it can probably help them in generating designs very, very controllably. So that's all from my side. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Ankit. Um, I have a, a, a couple questions, um, uh, one of which is sort of linking your work back to um, uh, uh, back to the work of uh, uh, Yannick and DK. Um, they're Kind of they when they're thinking about creativity and coming up with ideas and uh, obviously they're not doing work in the area of product design but it's sort of it's a very much of a top-down approach to thinking about design and creativity that basically here's a set of tools and you turn it over to an artist and the artist basically uses those tools to come up with something that people find really amazing and cool um, and in some sense, you, this is sort of the classic thing between the artist and the engineer. Uh, and you're kind of approaching it very much from a bottom-up sort of perspective, uh, which is to say, 
uh, okay, we're going to have these tools, which is basically going to go through, you know, all possible designs and then basically use this to sort of discover the one that people naturally would like. Um, and so, um, so this is sort of a question to you, but it, obviously your, your research doesn't really address this, but I just wonder your intuition, um, which is better? Um, uh, which is going to come up with a better watch, uh, uh, you know, a, a, you know, DK's approach, which they're given over to artists and using all these uh, um, uh, AI tools to, to create a beautiful watch or your approach? Um, so, I mean, uh, just uh, thinking of my feet, I think it might depend on the context, like in, in case of product design, um, you need to be creative, but the creativity is often constrained. You know, for example, mm -hmm. if you're designing a car, uh, it needs to have a headlight. It needs to have, you know, uh, you know, tires. It needs it, it. It it broadly cannot look like a motorcycle. You know, for example. But when you're thinking about, let's say, advertising, uh, and if you're creating a message for an ad, you know, you can be totally creative, and uh, uh, there are less constraints, I would say. So so maybe you know. Uh, both the approaches have their own uses. Sometimes you want the creativity to be constrained, where a bottoms-up approach might be useful. But sometimes you want, uh, like uh, DK was talking about, using those tools for brainstorming. You know, then you do not really want the tool to be uh, constrained too much. Okay, great, great. Um, uh, so maybe we can kind of uh, pivot this a little bit to kind of have more of an open discussion. Um, uh, maybe as a starting off point, uh, DK, what's your take on that? I mean, who who would you want to put the bet on? Uh, uh, bottom up model discovery approaches to creativity, or uh, top down um, human human approaches? So I think uh, for now, um, these tools are very good at uh, brainstorming, right? So I mean, of course, you can. Uh, engineer in uh, some sort of inspirations to be very different from already existing things. And then you leave it up to the humans to filter things out. And I think it's also very interesting because a lot of the studies that came out based on field experiments or no lab experiments have this uh, uh, lab experiments on the, you know, uh, Gen AI's effect on creativity or some productivity on some sort of performance. There's always this theme of like, the bad ones go to middle or better, right. and then the bad, like the experts, don't benefit as much. I think that's measuring uh, different things. Uh, if you talk about those who are at the top, like artists, I I had a talk with um, uh, Dean of a Juilliard who think this is the best thing that they came, you know, best thing for them. So they mm -hmm. have a better taste, they have a better training. So these tools will now put them even more far sure. above, yeah. right? Uh, yeah. and, and and content creators too. So I think if you, I don't know what would happen to the actual distribution. So we have follow papers on that. Is it Maverick, Mastermind, creating the, you know, expanding the landscape? Or uh, is it just everyone just like, again, uh, enabled by this creating the, you know, expanding the landscape? Yeah. To answer your question, I think for, uh, I do also have a paper related to something like this uh, on yeah. patents, right? So disentangling yeah. representation learning on patents. So for that, if you, I think the best thing would be now you make the model, you know, learn about the 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 hits, right? Gerald Genta's all the watches, right? The the yeah. is known for all these very well liked watches, and then maybe from there just like provide different differentiation, and then artists choose and things like that. I think that would be the most fruitful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, certainly it's the case of having these new tools. Certainly at the high end, like for example. Uh, uh, the art we have today is better than cave art, okay? And so, uh, well, not that cave art wasn't bad, but it was very limited because you just had limited tools to be able to produce it. And so basically you put it in the hands of creative people and basically you can come up with them. Yannick, do you have a, um, a perspective on any of this? Yeah, I think I'm very much agreeing with uh, what Tokyo just mentioned. I, what I'm thinking a lot of worrying a lot in, uh, is in, in the long term, whether... Now, if we kind of adopt those models and maybe we just like the final uh, switch where we take an image or we do not take an image and, and to stick with this example, uh, we, whether we lose our creativity over time and whether uh, we kind of lose the ability to generate like novel content. And uh, especially like talking, you talked about novelty and about the value of uh, of content. I think is 
if you look at the very top uh, percentile in terms of uh, creative people, they they only get there through like a, a ladder, right? So you you learn, you have an entire career of creativity, and you you train it like a muscle. And uh, I think that might be something where for now we do not really see the effects, but maybe in a couple of years down the road we we see something where um, for problems where you really have to think out of the box, let's say to come up with quantum theory or coming up with irrational numbers, right? These are things where you truly have to think in different realms than you've done before. Um, I think it's just very curious whether we will get into a narrative where this is going to be harder for us to do. Yeah, yeah. Get a, get a, so, yeah, so I think this that's a very good concern. Like, you know, for example, if, uh, you know, Gen AI is trained on a knowledge base and then that's sort of affecting people from, you know, uh, contributing, right? What would happen at the end? But for, for creative images like this, I feel like people are just inherently interested and enjoy this. Uh, akin to when photography came, you know, art did not die, yeah. right? So I feel right. like we're going to have a same sort of impact, at least on the creative side, because people just generally like this and genuinely just like it's enjoyable. So, and also it's not like people producing it and then just taking it as is. People also edit on top of that. But but I think I agree with you, Anik, in terms of like what would happen to things like knowledge base where people might not be uh motivated to contribute where the models don't have anything to learn from in the after a while i don't know yeah that's a really interesting uh thought that basically you end up basically uh so in, in a short it, it's almost sort of suggesting this uh dark vision of the future which is just the opposite of what people are worried about with ai where actually it just it, it sort of self-extinguishes uh it's sort of everybody basically keeps doing the same thing when ai produces it stops learning and then every all thinking stops you know and i don't know that's a uh you know that, that would be really a, an interesting uh, sci-fi movie to make so uh, and, and, and in a sense like it's what we already see right okay you mentioned that like novelty decreases over time after the adoption of gen ai and Probably in the future we will train on generated images those models. So like we see like decreasing novelty, and then we maybe have self and uh, re-emphasizing yeah. effects based on this. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I have like a couple of thoughts that I would like to add like uh, on this point. So so about one point that just Yannick just said that the concern that we might just retrain on generated, uh, you know, AI. I think that. Uh, so I uh, so at the Wharton conference last year in San Francisco, uh, there was a guy from Facebook uh, who gave a talk, and I spoke to him about this. So this is a uh, this is a serious thing that they have been thinking about for a long, long time. That uh, they do not want to retrain, you know, on things generated by these models. So uh, I mean, how they do it? Do they uh, have a data set? I mean, they he did not disclose how they do it. Actually, but but they do know about this problem, and they do not want to do it. That retrain on data uh, generated by ChatGPT or DALI or Stable Diffusion. And uh, about one more point, I mean, I'm just curious, and I would just like others take on this. That uh, it's like DK said that when photography came, art did not die. Uh, in fact, maybe because photography could take real pictures of real things, art became more abstract because artists wanted to differentiate themselves, you know, maybe because this is all happening in the virtual world, art might become more physical. You know, this is just my speculation, like sculpture or like fabrics or, you know, which 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 right now probably you need like a combination of AI and robotics. Maybe in the future that might also go away, but uh, but who knows? Yeah, this is just my, my take. Yeah. yeah. There's just one uh, audience question that came up. Um, from uh, it's kind of very closely related to what we were just talking about. Uh, it was if people get too adapted to a style of prompting, which probably works well for them, is there a risk of some sort of monotonicity for our large language models? Anyone want to to take take that? I guess the answer is yes, uh, but I don't know. And and I I would say yes, but the the you know the market would probably. Uh, solve that people wanting to come up with a different style of prompting to sell that uh, obviously the financial sort of motivation would probably make some people innovate on that end whether right. it's actual model or the prompting so market yeah. for 
prompting and these models probably will solve that. Okay, yeah. Uh, okay, so one question I have for you, what's next for you guys? Um, what, what's next, uh, what are you doing now and what's your, your next big project or what's, so do you see sort of the next big problem that you would like to, to tackle? All right, before we do, we got one question on uh, ethics, okay, which uh, it would be unfair to finish a session on AI and creativity without a question on ethics. So we got one. Uh, uh, there are, I don't know if you can see it, uh, there are tremendous ethical concerns over the use of AI in journalism and writing, uh, which are discipline creative fields. You have the same concerns in marketing. Uh, does it really matter if a commercial feature is a, um, a, a fake mountaintop to sell outdoor gear, even if consumer doesn't know it's AI generated? Uh, I'm going to send that one to uh, Yannick, who is uh, who is the one that was hawking that 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 possibility. What do you think? I, I think it's a very personal perspective on on ethics, and for sure there's a spectrum in the sense of like just as the. Uh, Whoever asked the question just mentioned, right? Like selling auto gear for marketing of the mountains are not real, like does not really have major real life implications. That would be my take. Uh, I think it would be more of a problem, for example, if you're a student and you you a photography class student and then you generate your image. What uh, Dokian also mentioned with the Sony World uh, photography contest last year, uh, where it was not a requirement, but uh, still it was not disclosed. And maybe this is more of an ethical dilemma here. Yeah, so I think it really is and will probably stay a problem that we have to live with in a similar manner than we also, we already had to live with Photoshop, right? You could always uh, kind of yeah. fake Photoshop and uh, fake images and use them for your advantage. And uh, I think the ethical dilemma here is is the same. However, it's just much more accessible so to much many or many more people. And hence, uh, I think we will see probably more uh, frequent ethical problems arising from this. Ankit or DK, do you have any um, uh, different take on that, perhaps? Yeah, yeah, I, I have like one take and maybe the DK can follow up. So I think uh, one concern which I've heard, like one is that companies are very, uh, uh, have to be careful that, you know, they do not end up, you know, infringing on any copyrighted, you know, material. That by mistake, you know, their ad uses something, you know, which has a copyright and then, you know, they can be sued. So. So maybe they have to be more careful when they use them, you know, anything for their marketing. Uh, uh, and at the same time, uh, I think companies like Disney, et cetera, uh, I like New York Times case has shown that, you know, their material uh, like Mickey Mouse, et cetera, is now increasingly shown in images created by these uh, models. So which, uh, you know, which is a matter of concern for them that, you know, their creation can be used by anybody. Uh, and, uh, you know, and finally, I think in this particular space, in the image space, uh, one major concern is that you might just start creating, you know, all sorts of content uh, which you do not want to proliferate, like, you know, lots of images of violence or lots of images of pornography, etc. And uh, so that's not related to marketing as such, but that's like a very, very broad ethical concern. Yeah, so uh, same, same. I was going to talk about the copyright and AI and regulation. It's uh, we don't have the tools yet, for example, to reliably detect, you know, is it actually infringing or if it's generated by the tools, can we prevent it? I don't, you know, who knows? Um, another thing, so to answer your question, Bob, uh, so we have several papers following the, you know, what I uh, pitched about the interaction between creativity and human uh, group level, as well as, you know, what's actually happening. Uh, some papers related to AI and regulations. Um, but one thing I wanted to end with is like, I'm looking forward with the Apple Vision Pro, with Apple Pro, right? That just yeah, launched. Apple Vision Pro, yeah. <laughs> yes, I, I am looking forward to text to world model just like Star Trek um, yeah. where I can mm -hmm. produce a world with the text and I can experience it with the Apple Vision Pro. I mean, it, it is kind of like exactly. pushing $4,000 if you get like the full thing. So uh, you must have, you really want it for that price. So well, yeah, that'll be really interesting whether uh, that will be end up being like a really takeoff thing or uh, Google Glass. Uh, 
Uh, well, I, actually, I, let me end on that. What do you think? Um, uh, you brought it up, DK. Do you, do you, what, uh, uh, what, you know, what, what do you think of the, the likelihood that that's going to see anything close to widespread consumer adoption? I have no idea. I mean, I, I know I want yeah. one. I want the whole okay. deck. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you're like in the extreme out tail of of these sorts of people. Uh, Ankit, are you um, uh, thinking about running down to the Apple store and getting a, a, a Vision Pro? Uh, maybe not now, but I guess, you know, like DK is saying that maybe in 10 years, maybe it will be very common. So maybe, but yeah. I might probably not buy that right away. <laughs> Yeah, Yannick, are you going to get one? Get it? Get it? We we actually ordered one already. So uh, oh really? Okay. Yeah. Well, this is like huge, uh, so it probably takes another two weeks. Uh, yeah. I'm really excited about it. But to also answer your question, I think I I can really assume that this will people will adopt it long term. Uh, probably, if it wouldn't be the case, it's uh, it's based on the assumptions, not really on the yeah. technology. Yeah. I think that's, and the cost yeah. will also drop. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm certainly, uh, I have it on my birthday list for uh, uh, for a present for my, my wife will hopefully give me, so we'll see. But anyway, we're kind of about out of time. So uh, I wanted to uh, thank everybody, the three of you, Yannick, Ankit, and, and DK for coming along today. And I learned a lot, and I think it was a fun interaction and fun exchange and so forth. And thanks for everyone else who's uh, had the time to kind of join us. And as we indicated, we have a, this is one of a series of these sort of webinars, and hopefully you can join us uh, for all the future ones. The next one's gonna be fascinating. It's gonna be on AI and work and workplace. And that's going to be on uh, same time, same time, same place. Uh, but it will be on in a couple of weeks on February sixteenth. So, um, so with that as a as a goodbye, uh, thanks so much for joining us.